Hello and welcome to the Southern Stars Election 2020 podcast. My name is Siobhan Cronin and I'm the news editor of the Southern Star. In this week's podcast, we talk to Goldeen TD Michael Collins, an independent candidate in the general election. Reporter Kieran O'Mahony chats to County Mayor Planakilty's Christopher O'Sullivan, who is running for Fianna Fáil. And first-time voter Alicia O'Sullivan from Skibbereen tells us her thoughts on the election. Uh, Deputy Collins, I get the feeling you've been campaigning for a while, even though the election was only called there last week. Uh, how's the campaign going? Um, I was elected in February 26, 2016, and I was campaigning every day since. Every since. So I haven't given up. Right. Um, I, I think it's important to be with the people. You know, I hold clinics from Kinsale right out to, to, to the islands, including the islands, out to Castletown Bear, out to the Mizzenhead, and in between in all those areas. And it's keeping with the people and talking to the people. And that's in its own right is, is uh, campaigning in its own right. But it it's, is, ta- it's keeping in touch. And now you mentioned there Castletown Bear, you'd be very well known in Bear and Mizzen. Uh, you are, it's a very big constituency and how are you getting on the other end? Uh, would you? How is your profile doing up around Kinsale you know, now? And obviously that would have been a concern at the, at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Said that's why I had a full-time uh, clinic uh, office opened in, in, in Bandon. Uh, it's available to people five days a week, sometimes seven days and seven nights a week as well, whenever we're busy. Um, we, I've also made sure that there was clinics in Kilbritton, Ballinadee, uh, Ballon Spittle, Kinsale, you know, in Shannon, Copying, Ballon, you know, the man, East, I kept that eastern side wide open so that I'd give e- equal stats to everybody, whether they were from the western end of the constituency or the eastern con- end of the constituency. I made sure that I was well got there. And, you know, issues like the, the secondary school in Bandon, the Brogan School in Bandon, is a massive issue for the people of Bandon. I've ke- highlighted that several times in the dawn. I think I've succeeded in getting a commitment from the government, the outgoing government. And it rose like the N71, the northern bypass in Bandon, a full complete of that and the, and the southern bypass in Bandon, um, a park and ride system from Clannacilty, you know, uh, the post offices that have been closed in Bandon, you know, I kept an active uh, involvement in the eastern end as well as making sure that the people of my own area are looked after as well. Right, now you've been a very vocal opponent of the current health strategy and of course you've got quite a high profile along with um, Deputy Healy Ray over the cataract and the hip operation buses to Belfast. Can can it be fixed? Or are we going to see those buses as an ongoing situation now, do you think, for the next few years? I think, first of all, uh, with the Brexit situation, there's a worry that the buses will end. There's an agreement uh, between both governments that that won't happen. So uh, the cross-border initiative will continue, which is hugely important. 1,500 people have taken that opportunity up to date, people that were going blind genuinely, and people that were suffering majorly from, from all sorts of uh, needs of operations. But that's I really think just a sticking plaster, really, for it, a bigger problem. It, it, sadly, I mean it sadly is, but it's a, it's a massive boost for those people that are going blind to be able to have that uh, opportunity to go there. We're looking. We we worked on that. We worked on that very closely with Deputy Danny Healy. But we need to look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture, what the mistakes that were made, and we're starting to redo these mistakes again. Was Bantry General Hospital in in in, in two thousand and thirteen? They shut the overnight A and E. They shut the overnight A and E in Mallow. I can only talk on behalf of the people of Cork South West. They shut the overnight A and E in Cork South West was a disastrous decision that led to people's lives being lost. If you're living in the peninsula, but it's not the peninsula anymore. I meet people from East along from Bandon, from Bandon, Bandon D place, telling me they go to Bantry. They don't want to go to Cork anymore because it's a bottleneck. So we need to look at reopening the A and E, not to be in a situation we find out that they're demoting from a special rural status hospital to a model two type hospital. If they do that, it'll be a further detriment. It's as good as closing the doors of Bantry General Hospital. That's the current situation that we're facing and dim decisions need to be overturned um, and, and, and as well as a small no more local decisions in relation to help is the home help situation the embargo on home help was an absolute disastrous decision made by the last government I'm totally convinced the reason for that was because of the hole in the ground the children's hospital above in Dublin where they spent millions I mean it just went out of control and there was nobody held accountable I would never like to call a motion no confidence in someone but someone has to be accountable and the book lies with the Minister for Health and all these ministers, his junior ministers of health down along the line, but the main Minister of Health. And that's why I call emotional confidence. I'm not going to go call emotional confidence. It should have been done sooner, but because of Brexit, I wasn't prepared to do that. And we had a situation where Mihal Martin, we had Leo Varadkar, one wanted an election at the end of April, the other one wanted the first May. Stop the catalogy. The people of Ireland need to be respected. And I made sure that respect was given by calling a vote no confidence, and the Taoiseach didn't have the numbers to add up, and the government would have collapsed. So he, he's gone to the country. But isn't the danger now that we're just going to get more of the same after? After the next election, or it'll be maybe it might swing the other way around, but we may get a Fianna Fáil government propped up by a Fine Gael government. So, what what power has a, has a a solo independent 
in in the next setup? Do you think? I think I think the the, the answer. Obviously, no one knows the setup of the next dawn, and I certainly don't. Um, I think this is a massive wake up call to every minister that sits there. I think they need to be held accountable. They haven't been held accountable, whether it's housing, whether it's health. Uh, Department of Transport. Uh, Shane Ross was one of probably the worst ministers that was ever put in place. That because they led to the closure. And I can see the sun, front of the Southern Star last week. Two uh, caterers closed their doors. That's been hemorrhaging right through West Cork for the last two or three years for decisions that uh, Shane Ross carried out. We have a situation that they weren't held accountable. I think independents will hold the government accountable. And I'm quite willing to sit down with any party and every party and every group after this election, like I did the last time. And if they look me in the eye and if they prove to me that they're willing to do something for the people of rural land, I will support them. But if they do what they've done the last time, and I sat around every, nearly every minister that's in cabinet today, and only one. I have to say that Tanish to Simon Coney is the only person that impressed me in all the negotiations. All the rest, including the current Taoiseach, played with the phones up over the table. We talking about issues, the rural line, the closures of post offices, shops, pubs, whatever it was. They weren't interested, and I knew they weren't interested. And on the last day I made a decision, I would not support a government that wasn't interested. And had, for the previous four years, continued a number of closures, and I certainly couldn't continue to support them in any way going forward. And will you support them the next time around if things don't change? I'll make no decision now who I'll support. Obviously, it'll depend on the programme for government. I'll sit down with all parties, whether that's Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, or whoever is going to be strong enough to set up a government. If I see that there's a genuine attempt of reversing some of the shocking decisions that were made in previous past, I will give serious consideration to join you. You cannot be a politician forever in opposition. But it was healthy to have a good, strong opposition. I was the only opposition voice in West Cork, you could nearly say for the past 10 years, because there was an agreement between Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil that prevented a, a real strong opposition voice there. And previous government, we had three government TDs. We needed, the people of West Cork needed a strong opposition voice. I gave them that, and I'll continue to give them that, if that is the case. But if it isn't, and if there's a situation that I think I can benefit the people of South West Cork to be a voice for them going forward in government, I'll consider that too. Now, homelessness is one of the big issues, definitely on the national stage anyway, and um, by judging by some of the media, you'd kind of be under the impression it's only an urban issue, but have, how have you come across it in your own um, clinics down here? Is it a big issue? Every there? week I'd have maybe 10 to 15 clinics. It's a huge, huge issue, and I will admit the further east you go, the, the, the worse it gets, but I find it in the Skibreen and the Bantry and, and Bandon clinics, are, I get people, maybe six, seven people coming in to me a week major issues. People losing their homes, the banks are foreclosing on them. I think the government should have stepped in their stronger vulture funds taking over companies, taking over individuals' houses. The upset, the mental health stress it's causing is phenomenal and it's been ignored in this country. Totally and utterly ignored. I think that we should have looked at solutions, small time solutions could have been the rural resettlement uh, program. I pleaded for that in the program for government. They actually entered into the program government and done nothing on it. And it's not going to resolve all. I accept that. But it would have been a help going forward. There was a number of issues they could have done in relation to housing, and they failed to do so. And this government, we can see what has happened since. Like, it's grown and grown, and you have children that have homes, there are people, there's people staying in, 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 in hotels, you know, families. It's an outrageous situation. It's very, very unfair. And it had to be, res it could have been resolved in some way. It's not always build, 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 because we can't keep building forever, you know. But the problem is there's a lot of young families coming to me. They're genuine. They're looking for planning permission. Can you do anything they, for them? They, they want to get a mortgage. They want to get, they want to get a loan from a bank. They're being refused. People with good wages. The sad thing is they're being refused today. I don't know how they're going to turn this around, banks. But they certainly must, and the government of the day, must go and be, play a stronger part in this and be stronger with the banks and stop foreclosing on people. People are, there is people. I know if someone has no interest in pain, they need to be chased up. But people that are trying their best, maybe for a health reason, maybe for some other just slight financial situation where they lose their job for a slight, a slight uh, short period of time, then people need to be spoke to and talk to and, put, and, and, and their situation will be put right. Most people in this country want to pay their debts and will pay their debts, but they're being chased out of their homes and it's terrible. It's a shocking situation. Well, when someone comes to you now in a clinic, um, Michael, like what exactly can you do for them if they're being threatened with eviction or they're a long time on the housing list? Well, there is a homeless officer in, in West Cork. We work, work very, very closely with, with, with uh, individuals and a very good uh, person he is too um, to work with. Um, what we try and do, obviously, is find out their financial situation. If they're not in a situation to get a loan, obviously, we have to look at see can we get them on the social housing list and, the, and HAP housing assistance. Then we have we, we, we work very closely with auctioneers, contact the offices on a regular basis, see what houses are available or not available. I have nearly one person full time at that 
in my in my office five days a week. That'll tell you the amount of people that are coming into us. And we, lucky enough, we have a very good success rate, but it's not enough. And I've had people that are sleeping in vans, sleeping in cars, and I'm trying to turn that situation around to get them some type of accommodation for us. And then what we try and do is build a file on those people and put in a strong foundation on that file. It's not just saying, oh yeah, we'll do that and we'll write a letter to the council and we'll get your house, good luck to you, and you're gone. It's not like that in my office. It's a, a very good work, hard working staff. And we work with the person right through from start to finish. Now, you've been quite a high-profile TD, um, I, I think you, you'd agree, uh, but one of the issues you, that you have been criticised for would have been your stance on um, immigrants, and you, I think the accusation of racism was even levelled at you a few times. Yeah, I, I think, you know, first of all, uh, racism is thrown at um, uh, politicians, regardless of what your views are, to, if you would just slightly t- uh, different, uh, uh, some perfections out there, you're deemed as racist, which is which is uh, totally wrong. And you, you says I'm a high-profile TD. I, I've worked very hard. I've taken no holidays. I've had I've spoken 400, and I think, 38 times in the doll. Sometimes the media don't pick up on things like that. They pick up on the things if I do wrong, but they don't pick up on the things I do right. But anyway, that's another story. But what I will say is that in relation to direct provision, uh, I spoke very strongly on direct provision. I think that, uh, first of all, it's appalling the way these people are being treated when they're brought into this country. We've seen situations since I've spoken out where families... 10, 11, 12 of these uh, families are brought in from what, coming from a war-torn country in many cases and brought in here and shoved into one bedroom house and people criticise me for saying something like that I says that, and, but I, what I did say was that everyone should be treated equally and that is the Irish person who's sitting out in the street by night dying in the street by night they have to be looked after as well as these people but these people when they come into our country need to be treated with some bit of respect and it's no point in bringing in thousands and shoving them into hotel rooms and saying job done and that's what this government has been doing they're getting up now and they're saying admittingly we've done this wrong let's put it right why wasn't there a rural resettlement so maybe one or two of these families brought into a rural community they would have fitted in perfectly not shoving them all into a hotel filling a hotel worrying people the services are not in, in, in that town or whatever so what I'm saying is yeah, look after the person that, that's on the street let, let that person be Irish or whoever on the streets of, of our country and also look after these people but do not flood them into hotels do not flood them into a community gradually bring them in and integrate with that community because they're like you go to rural towns and villages there's fabulous facilities there's nobody living in there we've had a minister uh, minister ring michael ring had a rural resettlement fund one project i think in west cock has been funded all the other projects haven't been funded at all we had a, a 500 thousand spent in, in in skull with a fabulous project for tourism that could have brought thousands of people to skull and all time time again, the only shovel ready project they had nearly in the whole of the country, they never got funding because why? We hadn't seen a minister here. Above Mayo, they have millions got. And all other uh, constituencies where they've seen the ministers, the millions got. We need to have an honest government with an honest focus, whether it's on the homeless, whether it's on, on, on direct provision, or whether it's on health. We haven't had an honest focus. We've had a very divided, where someone can wag the tail, it may get started in the Dublin city and the bigger cities, but not in our rural uh, constituencies. Now, Michael, you sound like you said there you never took holidays. You sound like a man who's 100% focused on politics all the time. Do you ever take a break? Do you ever switch off? Do you ever do anything that isn't to do with politics? Well, I suppose, I mean, very, I think we need reform in Irish politics, and maybe I'm pushing away back from to back to politics. <laughs> right. um, we, you know, I, I decided first I wasn't going to take the pay increase. Um, I don't take donations. People are setting up GoFundMe pages. You, I don't want to be owned by anybody when this election is over. I want to be back out there, owned by the people of Cox Up West, not by rich people or rich individuals or fancy companies. What do I do um, in my time off? I work with the community voluntary sector. I attend a lot of meetings, a lot of nights that have nothing to do with politics. Some people link me with politics in their meetings. I don't well, like Well, you that. may get a few votes out of it at the end of the day. Well, if I, uh, you know, maybe, maybe so. But I, I give 100% back to the community. I'm involved in 20, 25 different community voluntary groups. So that's where I get my biggest kick, is to see, can we get meals and wheels started out somewhere? Can we get something, little thing, little bonuses for our community, little festivals? Are you involved in farming? I am a farmer as well. Um, uh, my An son, undertaker? My son is uh, on the farm issue. My son is on the second year in agricultural college, so Hopefully he'd be taken over the farm. Right. I inherited the farm from my aunt. Uh, I'm an undertaker uh, when I get a chance. No, that's that happens very seldom, unfortunately, because I'm not in in West Cox. So you know, I kept my interest in other things because politi- I don't know. On February, the, the people might say they've had enough of Michael Collins. If they ha- if they've had enough of Michael Collins, um, I have to go back out there and 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 um, go back to the, the jobs I was doing before. And I've also found that you know the fact that I don't I didn't take the wage increase, which was, I felt that 
when I went to the doll, I had a certain amount of, of a wage that people knew I was getting, and that's the way I kept it. I've had three offers of wage increases, and I've refused them. I've supplemented that because I spend, I get 50% of my income as tax. I'm not trying to play the, the poor out here, but this is the facts. And I supplement my income by doing a bit of farming or whatever and doing a bit of whatever little odd jobs in between. And it keeps me in touch. If I'm standing in a farmer's yard talking to a farmer and my welding's on, he's telling me what the problem is. If I'm out there, we, need, we have a fishing crisis of the highest proportions. I need fishermen every day of the week. We need a standalone fisherman. I've been asking that for the government for the last number of years. They look at me as if I have two heads. What a, what a resource we have, and we're handing it. We're not handing it. We're throwing it away to the rest of Europe. We're not protecting our fishermen. We have no interest in Irish fishermen or no interest in Irish fishing. But by continuing these jobs here and there and going out to community voluntary groups and meetings at night, I meet people after the meeting, and then that's where the marine meeting starts, and they discuss about the issues that's affecting their communities. And that's where I get to feed that back into the doll again. That's why I think it's been as, as good a success as I can make. Now, speaking to some of the young voters around here, they'd say the number one issue for them is climate change. Where do you stand on climate change? Because you have been linked to some TDs in Kerry who uh, wouldn't be the greatest proponents of uh, having a climate strategy. So where do you stand on the I, issue? Do you know, in relation to the environment, and look, the Healy Rays are good friends of mine, but they, they do their thing and I do my thing. Do you know, you have to start on the ground because we can have a lot of fancy talk about the environment and, and, and it'll never happen. You know, I've looked, we, we have a warmer homes underfunded programme. I time and time again I've raised that to the dog. All the old people are being asked and all of us are being asked to get rid of coal. How can we get rid of coal when we have when we can insulate our homes? What are we supposed to do? Sit outside in, in inside in the barn turn uh, filled with hair straw? No. You need a complete new warmer homes scheme and they have to stop looking at you maybe give it to people with fuel loans. I have people that have fuel loans and can't get their homes insulated uh, because the funding isn't there. So that's number one that has to be done. Uh, number two I think in relation I try to see can we take cars off our road? I think it's very, very important to do the simple things and the park and ride uh, proposals I had to the Minister of Transport, again Minister Ross, but sure it was West Cock, it was Rural Ireland, that was out of his agenda. They refused that. A park and ride system from Clannacilty where all other buses would feed into it and we have a private operator here in Skibreen that's hopefully going to start some system like that sooner. We're still trying to get that across the line. Um, uh, to, to, it's Cork Connect, is it? Um, to take people from West Cock to Cork City every morning. Take a park and ride continuous shuttle system where you're taking hundreds and hundreds of cars off the road and ease the burden families because you might have one less car in their home. Um, there's, the, there's these issues. I've also called for the, the, the um, lowering of the VAT rate on, on insulation. So they encourage people to go back into the stores and they mightn't have to pay. They shouldn't even be VAT on it. That's how you encourage. That's how you change things. It's no point in being dreaming that we're going to, you know, you can't be telling people that are, have farms out there to, to cut back in the cows. You know, that's the dramatic stuff. And it looks good and stop eating meat. That looks nice. But it's, it's a ridiculous situation, to be quite honest. You have to look at what we can do, the realistic stuff that's out there. And that's what I've tried to, be do, tried to do in the last four years and saying, at all and I'll continue along that line take your cars off the road d- decrease or take your vet off insulation and make sure that warmer homes funding is available not available for three months of the year available for the full 12 months and insulate uh, uh, homes in, in Ireland Thank you very much for joining us Michael and best of luck in the election Appreciate it, thank you Thanks for listening to the Southern Star Election 2020 podcast Don't forget to pick up this week's Southern Star for all the latest election news, including interviews with candidates, analysis and comment. Available every Thursday in shops across West Cork and online from anywhere in the world via www.southernstar.ie. The Southern Star, your go-to destination for election 2020. Reporter Kieran O'Mahony caught up with the County Mayor Christopher O'Sullivan recently in County Hall to hear his views on his chances in the upcoming election. Councillor O'Sullivan joins TD Margaret Murphy O'Mahony on the Fianna Fáil ticket in Cork South West. This is a huge opportunity for me. It's an opportunity that I've been looking for for quite a while. Uh, I've been a councillor since 2007. Um, I've given my all uh, to that role. Uh, and I feel I've done a lot for the area that I've represented around Clannacilty, Skibreen, Dunmanway and that, that general area. Yeah. But um, I f- genuinely feel that I can do a whole lot more now for um, Cork South West and West Cork as a whole. It's an area that I think anyone who knows me knows my passion for West Cork um, is huge. Uh, and I know want to bring that to national level so that we can uh, you know, come up with policies, um, come up with uh, strategies, come up with different um, projects 
that will benefit uh, all of West Cork, the people who live in West Cork and people who maybe want to visit West Cork. So it's huge. It's a big opportunity for me and I want to, to absolutely grab the, grab the bull by the horns and take this opportunity. And Chris, just in relation to I suppose, the constituency, is the strategy of Fianna Fáil to, to get two seats in Cork South West? Yeah, obviously there's, there's two um, candidates and there wouldn't be two candidates unless we thought there was a, a chance of two seats. Now it would be by no means uh, easy. Uh, but I think we have two very, very strong candidates uh, in Mark murphy Omani, who I've known very well for a long time now. Uh, we get on really well, which is a plus. Um, you know, those old divisions that used to exist in Cork South West, I thankfully say no longer exist. Um, and she's a great candidate. She's been there for the last four years. Uh, she's worked hard uh, for Cork South West. She's travelled the length and breadth of the constituency and held clinics. Um, right across the constituency, so she's a good candidate. And then you have me on the other hand, who is the, the new um, guy, the, uh, the, the new kid on the block, I suppose, uh, for want of a better phrase. But I've got something to bring as well uh, in terms of, you know, I feel I've acquitted myself well in the role as mayor. I feel I could certainly acquit myself well in terms of representing West Cork and tackling the issues that people are facing on a day to day basis, be it homelessness, housing, um, obviously the health uh, sector is something that we have to target, but also just promotion of West Cork and making it better. Uh, it is such a fantastic tourism um, attraction. Uh, it really, we do need to push it more uh, nationally and internationally to get more visitors in, which benefits business. And there's a whole range of issues yeah. that I'll be pushing, but I feel that, um, you know, as a party, we have two great candidates who can um, push on and possibly get that outside chance of two seats. But is there, a, uh, some commentators have, have said that there may be a fear that it may split the vote and that you may not get a seat. There's always that fear. Yeah. My, myself and Margaret will, will sit down, we'll meet, we'll talk about uh, how we can best maximise it. Uh, at the moment, I think, look, it, it's um, uh, we haven't actually drawn any uh, lines or divisions, uh, but we can talk about that. I, I'm not sure. We, we, we're, we get on quite well. We'll be able to come up with something, uh, and I'm sure we get direction from yeah. the waters as well. So uh, let's, let's see that. But, you know, it, it, we, we, if you look at the local elections, uh, it worked out very well for us in my own constituency. Myself and Joe Carroll were, were streaks ahead within our, our constituency. Mm -hmm. and that, was, uh, that, that worked out quite well. We didn't split the vote. Uh, we had a fair share of the vote and, and, and it worked well. Great. And of course, as people know, you're up against your uh, girlfriend, Holly Cairns, and the Social Democrats. Yeah. And I suppose, how did that, when you got your nomination, how did that go down? Or? Uh, look, I, th I think Holly said that it was always an outside chance that it could happen. So we were uh, somewhat uh, prepared for this. But listen, we're in election mode now, and I think people have well covered the fact that we're, we're in a relationship and, and it's. That's, um, that's been well covered, but I, all I will say is, look, myself and Holly, we have a, a great relationship. I'm absolutely mad about her. Uh, she will make a fantastic candidate. Uh, I know that firsthand from talking to her. But uh, look, we get on well, but we, we differ uh, politically in terms of the political parties and political representation. So look, I, I've, not, I've very little further to say yeah. that only to wish her uh, the best of luck. She knows that. Uh, and I'm sure we will be very, very supportive of each other. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, it's unusual, uh, it's not something we see every day, it's not, no. but uh, we're strong enough that uh, we'll be able to deal with it, no problem. Thanks for listening to the Southern Star Election 2020 podcast. Don't forget to pick up this week's Southern Star for all the latest election news, including interviews with candidates, analysis and comment. Available every Thursday in shops across West Cork and online from anywhere in the world via www.southernstar.ie. The Southern Star, your go-to destination for election 2020. Today we have in studio Alicia Sullivan, who is one of Ireland's most vocal young voices in the climate change debate. Alicia is a former Lions Club ambassador, a busy climate change activist, and last year she attended and spoke at the UN Climate Summit in New York. So Alicia, welcome to the Southern Stars Election 2020 podcast. So just tell us a little bit about yourself and your interests. Yeah, so I'm 18 years old. I'm currently sitting the Leaving Cert. Um, I'm from Castlehaven, just outside Skibreen. Um, and like you said, I've been quite busy over the last few years advocating for different issues. And of course, the last year and a bit, it's been climate change at the forefront. Yeah, so I guess I've with all that advocating comes being interested in politics inevitably and the legislation I guess and policy, policies that surround all those issues. Um, so that's kind of where I started and that's where I am now. Where yeah. you are. And uh, so this will be your first time now to vote in a general election. Yeah. And what do you think are the main issues concerning the people of West Cork? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because I think, you know, 
from from speaking to people and pe- speaking to my peers, obviously climate change comes up again and again. And I think especially for West Cork, because we're such like a, a local kind of market uh, produce um, area, that the effects of climate change will always come into effect in our area um, in terms of businesses and jobs and, and people's opportunities as well in, ter- in terms of tourism. Um, and, and, and obviously homelessness is a massive issue. In West Cork, I think it's not as profound um, in terms of seeing people on the streets, but it's still there. Um, and then obviously healthcare as well, like we have um, the bus going up and down to Northern Ireland. And it's it, it, the three biggest problems I think have to be overcome and they, they really do tie in together as well when you look at climate change and equality and opportunity for everyone. Right, and do you think that your one little vote might make a difference this time? <laughs> I hope so. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think of course, like, um, I think everyone should vote. I've been advocating for all my peers to pick up the RFA2 forums. Obviously, we weren't given much time. Right. Uh, it's my first time voting, so I wasn't registered at all. Okay. Um, so, you know, it didn't give us much time, a bit of a week and a few days. It's a difficult register. process. It is. There is a lot of barriers to it. Um, a lot of people were confused over the different forms. Right. Um, I ended up printing out some at school and, <laughs> and throwing them at people um, and telling them to go down to the Garda station at lunch. Well done. Um, but it has to be done, like, and there's no one else doing that um, for young people. And I think it was just around 58,000 people turned 18 last year, and that's a hell of a lot of votes. So Absolutely. Um, and at school then, the whole concept of the PR vote, was that explained to you? Do people know how they're voting? It's quite a complicated um, system that they don't it, have in a lot of is, countries. Yeah, it is complicated. Um, yeah, I think the last time I was taught about it was probably in CSP in first year. Um, and that would have been at quite a basic level. Um, but I think there's a lot of young people who wouldn't understand the concept of voting or PR or why it's so important to vote almost. I've almost had to kind of preach to people it's not about politics, it's about the price of your car insurance, your student accommodation, like if you're from a one parent family, all these extremely important things that do affect you but they're just not making the connection then between the people who are, I guess, standing for election and, and those issues. Yeah. And have uh, many of the candidates impressed you so far? Yeah, I think uh, of course the big parties are going to get in and I think mm-hmm. it's time that I might vote for people who are going to stand up and almost, you know, stand up to them and oppose them. They're going to get in anyway, and I'd like to see people who are going to um, oppose the things they're doing and stand up to them and question as well um, what they're doing. I think that's extremely important in this election. And have you made a decision, decision about how you'll vote, or is it too early days for you yet? I've definitely thought about it more than probably any other 18-year-old in right. Um Yeah, I think I'm going to vote for uh, someone who will be progressive for West Cork, Cork South West, somebody who's going to move forward, and like I said, someone who's going to stand up against the people who've been, I guess, pulling back on moving Ireland forward in terms of climate change and healthcare and housing. Right, well now given that I'd say you're probably not going to vote for one of the two main parties, um, do you think really that those small, uh, smaller candidates who are kind of a little bit maybe in the smaller parties or even independent or even mm. solo, that uh, they can affect any change? Or will you be optimistic that anything will change yeah. after the election? I would, be, I would be extremely optimistic that those people make changes. Like if, you, if, you're, give, if you're going to vote for the bigger parties, uh, it's obviously your choice, but we're voting for the same thing day in and day out. We're never going to get a change. And... Of course, they're always going to be there. Um, that's just our, our, our politics in this country. But we need to bring in more people, like I said, who will stand up against it and hopefully kind of change the dy- dynamic a little bit and have a little bit of cross-party almost uh, solutions to these things. Right, and you kind of touched on it a bit earlier, but um, are, will many of your peers vote, do you think? Um, after all your... Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope after all that printing, yes. I hope so. Um, on, a, on a more national scale, I think definitely more young people People are motivated to, to vote than ever before um, and even now people asking me I've been really vocal on social media about how to vote and there's been a really great response to, to it so I definitely think a lot of my peers will now vote um, which obviously is, is super important with everything that's going on right now um, and like climate change and the youth mobility that's happened with that and I think young people like I said do care they just need to be motivated and encouraged and 
even like lowering the voting age in my opinion would give young people in school the chance to be encouraged and helped you know to vote for the first time whereas when you come 18 like for me in leaving cert priest coming up oh, it's a hard time exactly it's a hard time to uh, be learning about this thing especially with the barriers in place so yeah exactly yeah. okay well thank you so much for, for coming in thank, <laughs> thank you, you for your contribution thank you thanks for listening to the southern star election 2020 podcast if you enjoyed it Please make sure to rate, review and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Acast, Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts.